Okay, I think for uh, to respect everybody's time, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome, welcome to all in the room, and welcome to those who are online. I think we have nine or ten folks who are rolling in. Uh, my name is Dr. Lisa Holstey. I'm one of the co-directors of Designing for People. Welcome to the seminar today. Uh, I'm going to start this afternoon by by doing the land acknowledgement, which is that the seminar that we are here to enjoy is hosted on the UBC Point Grey campus, and that sits on the ancestral, unceded, and traditional uh, lands of the Musqueam First Nations folks. And uh, I'd also like to pay respects to all elders past and present. And with that, I am delighted to turn over the main hosting for today to Professor Tony Hodgson, who's going to introduce our speaker. Over to you. Thanks, Tony. Thanks. Hi, uh, I know some of you. Uh, good to see you again. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Mechanical Engineering, and I've been associated with Designing for People, I think, since its inception, probably before when I was uh, still the human computer interaction group. Um, so uh, today's seminar has, uh, I, I, we're actually double purposing it. <laughs> Uh, so today's speaker is Dr. Adam Clare, who's a fac also a faculty member, my colleague in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. Uh, he did his PhD training uh, at the University of Liverpool in the UK, in, originally in integrated engineering and then subsequently in manufacturing engineering, and ended up going to the University of Nottingham shortly thereafter, uh, where he rose through the ranks fairly quickly, and uh, we were fortunate enough to be able to attract him over to UBC last year uh, to join uh, so mechanical engineering and materials engineering are now jointly running a program in manufacturing engineering and so he has expertise in additive manufacturing and uh, shape modeling and, and a bunch of very interesting things uh, you'll see today um, he's also applied and is a candidate for the patrick campbell chair in, in engineering design and as part of that uh, we're we host networking events where we try to uh, bring the candidates into contact with the broader community. So we thought since he was already scheduled for DFP, we would just use that second hour uh, for this purpose. Um, so please feel free to stay afterwards and, and chat with Adam. Uh, but in the meantime, over to you, Adam. Welcome. So thank you very much, Tony. Also, uh, thank you very much for the kind invitation to come along and, and, and meet you guys and, and spend a bit of time with this community. To my shame, I've been here only a year at UBC, but not yet managed to meet some of you and find out about the great work that's going on here. I hope today I can impress upon you that some of the things that I've been doing may have application or interest to this community. And if I'm successful, people ask me difficult questions throughout the course of this talk, but also maybe pop over afterwards and, and, and ask a few questions, find out a bit more. I'd be delighted to meet you, be delighted to find out about what you're doing uh, and how we might work together. Uh, so the title of my, my talk is, as I was tweaking this talk the other day, True Biometrics, and I've put true in inverted commas and italicized it uh, as a riff off our friend Donald Trump, who has various different truths, which I, I'm not sure I subscribe to that vision. But nonetheless, that will work. This will work. Here we go. Uh, so an overview of the talk today, I'll, I'll say briefly something about who I am. Uh, I'm a mechanical engineer by, by training for the most part. That is largely uninteresting to, 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 to you guys, I think, and I want to move on from that as quickly as I possibly can. Uh, but then I do want to, to make a shameful, a shameless advertisement for a new uh, technical elective that I've started that's, that's hosted as part of our Man U program. And I want to show you some of the awesome things that, that the most recent color have done in that space, because that will feed back into kind of a new avenue of research for me in democratization of design. Uh, then I'll only through kind of a, a historical note to, to say something about what I mean by true biomimetics. Delve a bit deeper. Uh, I won't go deep into the mathematics around this because that's really not important. What is important about my talk today is this kind of new cool tool that I've been working on and wanting to find other people to get involved and engage with that. So without further ado, into the body of my talk as a whole. Uh, a research background. So for the last ooh, 12 years, I spent my time looking at stuff like this. This is a blisk. Uh, so when you travel on a, a modern aircraft that has a gas turbine, you normally have two or four of these on the wing. They spin around super fast. They suck air in. Uh, they, you know, they can bust some fuel, spit all of that out the other end, and they go fast. Uh, and they're important. They're important to the wealth of nations. They're important to the... Uh, 
the militaries of various nations who have this capability. It's a sovereign technology is one of the things that we might refer to. So I spent a lot of time thinking about how you design processes to manufacture these things and how you might repair them. That said, uh, I've been involved in a number of different things that might ring bells. So additive manufacturing or 3D printing, taking a bit of energy and a bit of material and building stuff. So this is this is commonplace. Now, just a quick straw poll. Who has a 3D printer at home? Yeah, one or two. Who has a, a 3 access to a 3D printer in their daily life? Okay, so we're really getting up there now. This is no longer... Uh, some kind of exotic technology. It's part and parcel of, of how we do what we do. Uh, you know, if I was to, to to ask this in a secondary school now, most hands would be going up. You know, it's getting up there in terms of most requested Christmas gifts every year now, which I think is a fantastic thing to see. Uh, but when I when I was a student or years ago, uh, it was very much a nascent technology and we had to, to build everything ourselves. Not so the case today. Uh, more recently, as Tony said, I, I joined the, the University of, of Nottingham. Two of the things I'm most proud of is spinning out a couple of companies, not just because the technology that they, they, they now boast and sell, uh, but also that these are led by former PhD students. So Sintam Engineering specializes in drilling very small holes in bits of metal. Laugh you may, bored you might be, but it turns out it's actually a very important thing for, for gas turbines and manufacturing technology. Uh, so that is managed and directed by a former PhD student and employs uh, three former PhD students. Similar, Texture Jet uh, specializes in finely polishing metal components. Bored once again you might be, but valuable this is. Uh, once again, managed and directed by a former PhD student. Uh, but as I say, in recent times, I've kind of specialized in uh, repair of these things, gas turbine engines, uh, and more specifically, miniaturizing technologies for those. So design is, is a central part to what I do, but not really designing for people. So most of the things I designed for are hard metallic things that don't have emotions, don't have feelings, uh, and don't really care how I think about them. It's absolutely fantastic. <laughs> Uh, but now that I've I, I, I've moved to, to to UBC, I have this opportunity to pivot and think differently. Think differently about how I use the skills that I've perhaps honed and use the teams or interact with the teams that I've developed over a period of years. So, with that in mind, uh, I'd like to do this shameless advert for uh, for the Tech Collective that's now hosted in in the Man U program, which relates to uh, designing for additive manufacturing. Uh, and that comes about uh, from thinking about the way technology and design is changing, more specifically how our undergraduates upon graduation will be exposed to these technologies mid-career. Uh, question for the audience, there's something extremely fishy about this image. What is fishy about this image? Please. The keyboard looks kind of funny. It's got the wrong number of buttons. The buttons are in a weird place. Does that give you a clue about what is fishy about this image? When I gave this in my first lecture, it's my technical elective, the whole class had got it by this point. Please. Is it, AI? it is AI. Thank you very much. Absolutely spot on. Uh, so this was generated through uh, the, the tool Mid Journey, which runs out of Discord. If you've not played with this, it's an immense amount of fun. You use a natural language instruction. So you say, uh, as a prompt, Professor 3D Printing, and this is the first image that it generated. And it's not perfect yet, as, as, as you pointed out at the back there. They don't know how to do keyboards quite so well. You'll also notice that these things don't often feature hands or fingers because they're very difficult to render and get correct. Uh, but most bizarre is that you've got this kind of uh, handsome chap on the left-hand side. This really weird thing is supposed to be the 3D printer, I guess. And within that, you see kind of the image of the professor reflected. So I, I don't know how that comes about. But the reason why I, I bring this up is this is a new, free, readily available capability. We're creating images at, uh, at a moment's notice to our heart's desire. We can re-render those. We can change those. There's another cool trick that you can do with this. I don't know if it's so cool at all, but if you now use a prompt which merges uh, My Ugly Mush uh, with Professor 3D Printing, it creates these monstrosities. <laughs> that wasn't intended as a joke, by the way. I'm never coming here ever again. 
Um, so this design for, for, for additive manufacturing, technical elective, uh, this is a 3D printer. It's probably a $600 investment. Uh, the cost of material to make something like this is probably less than $10 or $20. So the, the value add, the margin to be made, the clever stuff, is not necessarily in the machine tool itself. So we need to go, to go back, back a layer. Uh, these machines take a data set, some information that tells them where to put material and importantly where not to put it. Uh, but there's value in processing that data. We take that information, we add value to it. We apply it for a purpose. We customize it. We understand an end user and modify it for that purpose. But there's also this ability to now acquire data cheaply and freely. Users of iPhones will be able to 3D scan, albeit in a crude photogrammetry fashion. Is that, has anybody, uh, iPhone users, of which there'll be many? Okay, has there, everybody played with that 3D scanning function? No, kind of. Give it a go. So you are empowered for the investment of an iPhone and a $600 3D printer. You are enabled to scan something. It could be your cat. It could be your hand. It could be anything that you so wish, and then turn that into a solution for yourself. This is fantastic, but if, if the, the machine tool itself has negligible value and negligible margin, then the value proposition, the place where we add real value, the place where we make a real difference, is in acquiring and processing of the data. Uh, with that in mind, I tasked uh, my class this semester of something like 25 students, put them up into groups of five and gave them various briefs. Uh, one of those was an obfuscation challenge. If you are an owner of non-fungible tokens, FFTs, you know that their value is in their, their uniqueness, your ability to be able to sell that later. I, I think the whole thing is absolute nonsense, by the way, and it will never be a passable commodity for what it's worth. But I wanted to challenge my students to create non-fungible physical tokens. So this particular group designed an algorithm which grew uh, cartoon-like pot plants. And in each time step or each in iteration, created a QR code. We're then able to obfuscate that information. Obfuscation means kind of make confusing, to hide, to make more obscure, if you like. And then reverse that to be able to have independently printable artifacts that are, are unique, cannot be cloned. Uh, building on that still further, another group decided to create a tool, this is important now, a tool that would automatically generate one of these things, complicated funny wheel with, with noggins on it. So this is what we call a, a music wheel, commonly found uh, in a music box. So you change the position of these dots or these noggins and the, 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 the speed at which this rotates and it will play a different tune. This particular group wanted to go from readily available music sources to automatically generate the music wheel that could then be 3D printed. It sounded like absolute junk, by the way, and I'm not going to repeat it for you, but in principle, you can see how they've identified an opportunity and made use of the technology to, to produce a deliverable. Uh, one, of, one of the nice projects I thought was a group who set about designing for people in that they wanted to create customized mice. Uh, so the, the student in question does live by the beach, went down and, and cast their hand in sand, used an iPhone to scan that, built an app that then customizes, uh, customizes the surface, the morphology of these things, and created something. So we would be, this is an example of one of the outputs from this software. Please don't look at this as, a, as an artifact and a deliverable in its own right. This is actually not important. It's one of infinite solutions which are generated through uh, a software set built in, in Blender. Can I just get a quick show of hands? Who's, who's using Blender in their research at the moment? Absolutely fantastic. I'm one of the biggest fans of, of Blender and its capability. And I love that community and how they come together to solve problems together. Uh, so I'll, I'll pass from my, my box of broken dreams. If I pass that round, please take a look. Break it, you bought it. They're about $5,000 each. Jokes. Uh, Moving on, uh, for light entertainment, uh, one of the groups towards the end of this, uh, this course decided that they wanted to make cat memorials. They convinced me there was a market for this. Uh, so for a, a modest fee, what they would do is take a photograph of your beloved Moggy, uh, use the, the contrast within that image to create a 3D rendering, and then take some information. It could be paw prints scanned again by an iPhone to render that and build a, a 3D printed artifact that will forever remind you of your cat. Uh, so 
if you're interested in this elective uh, and, and you have the ability as part of your your course or your program to come in and join please do drop me an email i'd be delighted to have additional perspective on that and Adam, any prerequisites? Uh, it would not be necessary to be coming from a manu or a, a mech uh, or a mat background but i would be happy to have discussions on a case-by-case -case basis if you have prior experience of using blender for example Come and talk to me anyway. I'd be delighted to find out what you're doing and how it's affecting your research. Uh, so in answer to that question, case by case is probably the best way of dealing with it. Uh, I am approachable. My, my email address is available, at, I think, in the advertisement for the talk. Okay, uh, so that's a tech, tech elective that I thought you might be interested in. Uh, the body of the talk, uh, uh, which is kind of occupies a huge amount of my bandwidth and my thinking time these days, is, is this thing that we're calling true biomimetics. Uh, I think all research is done uh, as part of a team these days if it's going to have meaningful impact. Uh, so the colleagues on the left is a guy called Mirko, a fluid dynamicist. Uh, Chris Tuck is my former boss, APBC for research. Uh, recently graduated PhD student, uh, Jan Hendrik Roth. Uh, and then I've also got a, a fantastic emergent team at, at UBC. Uh, you might not have met uh, Miranda from Mathematics. Absolutely fantastic, and she's just propelled the the, the, the way this research direction is going into new territories. Uh, students I've been working with, Attila and Brett, over the summer, and relatively new PhD student, Sajal. Okay, uh, so a historical note and a sensitive one. Does anybody know who this person is? I'm not surprised. He's been dead for about 150 years, uh, but his name is Sir Francis Dalton. Uh, and because of Sir Francis, we have all kinds of new statistical tools. He's one of the first person to talk about deviation, for example, and the application of modern statistical methods in understanding uh, the biology that we see around us. Uh, famous for trying to correlate uh, the height of the father with the height of the son, completely neglecting that the height of the mother might have a, a role to play in that. So alongside all of these kind of really fascinating things and useful things that we still use today, uh, there's all of these kind of kind of oversights that we made. Perhaps before I, I talk about the other things that, that, that uh, Sir Francis Galton developed that are of interest to my research, I think we, we shouldn't forget that he's also the attributed as the father of uh, eugenics. Um, uh, so that is a, a shameful part of the contributions that he made or the thinking that he made through the course of his professional life. But one of the things I wanted to introduce is, is one of these things, to this day we call it the, the Galton board uh, or the bean machine. So what, what he discovered was that if you take a uh, box of beans, you pour it through uh, an array of pins, you can get this kind of funny pattern that appears over and over again. And we know in mathematics that this, this distribution is, is characteristic throughout the mathematical space. If I, if I measure the length of your little finger, if I measure the length of your hand, and I do that over a population, I will get a distribution that looks something like this. And this was really fascinating. It, it, it bedazzled uh, Francis. And when talking about this, he says, the law would have been personified by the Greeks and deified if they have known of it. It reigns with serenity and in complete self-effacement amidst the wildest confusion. Uh, what he's trying to say here is when you really understand this, it's so beautiful, it's so abstract. If the Greeks would have understood it, they would have named a god after it because they also would have been amazed by what they saw. So on the back of that, once we start to be able to, to measure, I heard you talk earlier about the importance of measurements in this space. When we have the ability to measure and measure at scale, we start to be able to do all kinds of weird and wacky things. And that affects mechanical engineers just like me. So there is a subset of, of mechanical engineers who call themselves biomimeticists. And they expert, their expertise is in looking at nature, finding things that are really cool and work really well, and then just copying them or mimicking them. The problem is, for most of them, they get it slightly wrong. Are, is there anybody who, in the room who does biomimetics? So I can be completely offensive to that field of study in that case. Uh, so here is the classic example, the shark. Uh, El Tiburon is uh, a super swimmer. Uh, swims faster than we could design a similar engineering system to design if we use technology that's within our gift. 
Uh, people have studied the shark, noticed that it's covered in these things. They're called denticles. So little hardened features that are arranged in an array over the surface of the shark. Uh, they make the shark resilient to, to battles or rubbing up against coral reefs. But also it turns out that they're, they're very efficient in augmenting the efficiency with which the shark can swim. All right. We don't need to, for the benefit of this discussion, we don't need to understand why. We just need to understand that it's there and it works kind of well. OK, great. Let's copy it. So what we do uh, in current class technology is we, we measure one of these little denticles and we copy it over and over and over again. But we're missing a march. If you look at these on top of the shark's body, you'll see that there are many of different sizes. So there's a population effect. The system works better because there's some stochastics, posh word for randomness, in how these are constructed. So here is a, uh, a man, in inverted commas once again, made equivalent, which is not biomimetic. So we have the ability to 3D print these. We have the ability to manufacture structures like this through micro machining technologies. In other words, making small stuff over and over again. But we see in the natural world, this is what it looks like. And we know that this is more efficient than this. By the way, if you are a, a, a sushi fan and if you've not visited the sushi university, there is a tenuous link to sushi here. So. Traditionally, wasabi japonica, which is the root from which wasabi comes from, is ground traditionally by shark skin. And the way that works is shark skin has a texture. So it has a cutting or kind of a grinding face in one direction. So as I pass the wasabi in one direction, it makes a small amount of paste. And when I go back in the other direction, it slips. That is one of many useful fa useless facts you might acquire during the course of my talking. That was not a joke either. Uh, Back to true biomimetics. So the, the, the kind of the principal tenant of the, of the argument I'm making in my research is, yeah, absolutely fantastic to take inspiration from the world around us and the natural world. Uh, but let's think about it differently. Let's understand that there is variation within these, uh, these systems. Let's understand that we can mimic that better. So about five years ago now with a fantastic PhD student, Jan Hendrik Roth, we started thinking about not just measuring unit cells, but measuring the variation. And a lot of this exists in the literature if, if you're willing to go exploring in uh, biology uh, annals, you'll find that somebody has gone away and done this. Can you imagine having to do this under a microscope measuring shark denticles over and over again? Uh, but that's useful for us because we can then backfill a distribution. Recalling, I showed you this, which I can now pass around. We're able to compute that funny curve that we see over and over again in nature. And it's not identical, it's parameters, it's width and it's height changes uh, as we look at different biological systems. But we're able then to better emulate uh, the things that we see in the natural world. So you then use some computer-aided design skills, you then write some software that sprinkles in this randomness or creates a randomness dial. Similarly, we create a unit cell, we parameterize the unit cells, so these things have a width, a height, an angle, how many lumps they have, uh, how long the stalk is, and you can boil that down to 26 parameters. You can then, within a Blender program that was written by my students, you're able then to control how that distribution looks. So you move away from something that looks really quite uniform to something that matches the system that we see in nature. Uh, and we can do all kinds of cool things with this. And I'm gonna show you how that works. But before I do, uh, it's not just the shark skin. It would be remiss of me to allow you to come away from this section of the talk and think that it was only the shark where we see this variation. We see it in, uh, across biology. And we also notice that this, as we fold this down to a stochasticity level, a single number that we can attribute to randomness. We can see this over and over again, and we can then better imitate. So we might want to imitate the, uh, the honeycomb structure. Honeycomb is actually a really easy one. So here's, this is using the, the wing structure of, of aircraft that you would have flown on. Super light, super strong. If anybody wants to stand on it, you're welcome to stand on it like that. Don't stand on it like that. That will cause problems. But feel how light and how strong that is. Uh, so great. There is inspiration here for, from nature. We can kind of quantify that and we can improve how we mimic things. So true biomimetics then, a phrase that, I, that I'm coining, uh, superior emulation of biological structures 
by imitation not only of the unit cell, but the characteristics of the system as a whole. So kind of a, a verbose way of saying, don't just look at a small bit, look at the system as a whole and copy everything that you see, not the easy bit. So how do you do this? Uh, this has been boiled down, so it involves a minimum amount of mathematics. And what I would hope is, if I do my job and I explain this clearly, the principle is something that you might use and might find useful. So uh, let's start with dots. Dots are easy because they float around in 2D space. And these dots are arranged in a uniform pattern. If I was to think of one of those individual dots, I can then say, I want this system as a whole to reside in different places. I want to be able to sprinkle in some randomness. So I suddenly say that my little red dot can move around a little bit, not too much, not too little, but it can move around a little bit. And as I make my way through each individual dot, I write a program which makes a decision on where that dot should be placed. And that distribution, that, that instruction, if you like, of where the dot can go, can follow any function that I like. And this is the, this is the fantastic bit about working with my colleagues in mathematics, because they totally changed my game. I thought there was only three flavors of ice cream. And then they opened up the other side of the, the ice cream parlor. And I found things like rum and raisin. So I've really got Miranda to thank for that. So some of the things that I can do, I can... I can change the types of randomness because there isn't just one. I can skew the randomness. I can write functions for my randomness and ultimately create patterns which are weird and wacky. Some of you in the audience are probably thinking, oh my goodness, where is this guy going with this? Bear with me a little bit longer. I promise it will be worthwhile. Uh, so that applied to the shark skin is, is, the, is the secret sauce, if you like, to make those random shark skin thingies I showed you before. All right, so the different types of randomness. This is a uniform array of dots. If I push uh, into the next slide, I turn up this sigma value. For the benefit of this conversation, this is like my randomness dial. This is how much randomness I introduce into the system. And in this case, it's isotropic, meaning that the randomness I allow in this direction and the randomness I allow in this direction are identical. What about if I start playing with changing the randomness level that I put in a different direction. So it becomes anisotropic, posh word for not the same in both direction. I can then gradient these things. So in this case, I put a bounding box around each of the data points. As I go from one direction to another, the randomness level increases. So these are the kind of things that if we were to take a, a slice through my, my arm, for example, I'm not willing to do that for, for the benefit of today's talk. But if I looked at the, the, my bone in cross section, I would see that it's comprised of lots of little pores. And the relationship that they have changes as I make my, my way to the center of the bone. Nature is that smart that it, it only puts material where it's required. So these are tools that are starting to, and I, I won't harp on about these because they are essentially boring if explored in this detail, but it's another set of options that allows me to explore how I might make new and interesting structures. All right, more functions, more weird and wacky graphs, uh, but 2D graphs are useless. Let's think about volumes. Uh, and this is where things start to spice up a little bit. So I'm gonna hand all of these out. Uh, some of these are plastic, some of these are metal. Do have a little look at them. They're all 3D printed though. That's what's in common to them. So if I want to use this principle to make uh, a 3D volume, I can then apply randomness to the location of some, uh, some volumes within a, a larger volume. And I do what's called a Boolean sum. So I get one and take it away from the other. And when I do that, I can make cool lattices like this, some of which are, are in front of you now. The posh word for these is, is kind of struct-based lattices because they're connected by individual struts. Uh, and we wrote uh, a, a little paper about this, which is five simple tools for creating these stochastic lattices. So if, you, if you're minded and interested, this paper tells you exactly how to do it and arrive at structures like this. And you could, if, if so minded, do these things within your, the confines of your own house. And there are a set of rules around this, which I don't think are important to, to this conversation, but just wanted to show you that that exists. But the strut-based lattices don't cover everything that we see in nature. There are whole other families of lattices. This one, oh, 10 points for this. Does anybody know where this one comes from? The inside is very tasty, but if you were to stand on one, it would be very painful. So I think it's a wet. This one? 
Sea action, exactly spot on. So this is a sea action spine. If you look at these under a microscope, they have this kind of texture, which doesn't look uh, very close to the structures that, that I've referred to previously. This clo more closely approximates a surface-based lattice. Uh, and I can explore all the way through the natural world and find inspiration for these designs. So wouldn't it be great that it, I, if I had a universal tool that would allow people to deploy these things for their own purposes? So I'm approaching at this point the limit of my expertise, the limit of my ability to A, create these things, but also deploy them. And that's why I need more help. Da Vinci is very good on this. And the last of his quotes is referring to nature and says that nothing is superfluous. And as a designer, I, I think that there's no finer inspiration. Uh, so you go away, you look at nature, you start to copy these distributions at scale now. So not, no longer focusing on individuals, but thinking of families of structures. And it might not surprise you, but uh, I'm not the first person to think about these things. In fact, uh, we can trace uh, early research into surface-based lattices to, to this guy, Schwartz, incredible beard as Professor Schwartz, I think. If only I had a beard like this, my fortunes might be different. Uh, so Schwartz was, was super smart. He uh, created the mathematics for these complicated structures that, that, that I've shown you, uh, but never visualized them in his lifetime. So he wasn't able to graphically represent these. And I, and I just think that that is such, such an abstract concept to be able to, to have this way of thinking, but never to be able to see it. With time, researchers started to get metal wires and they would fold them and dip them in soapy water and create bubbles to help visualize this. Through the early 1900s, we started to make the honeycomb, which is the one I suggested you could stand on. And as we make our way through time, we, we get the age of additive manufacturing and this, some researchers give some an Ashby punching out of, uh, of Cambridge who started to numerically quantify these things and how they behave. But now we're really cooking when we get at this point. Because these structures are so complicated and I can't envisage them in my head, that the role of the human designer is probably going to be cut short a little bit here. And that's because these things really are complicated. There's so many different dials. I can stretch these things. I can squash these things. And if I start saying I can make them random, it becomes even more complicated still. Just have a quick check of time. I make it 25 to the hour. How long do you want me to speak for? Is it about three and a half hours today or somewhat less? Than <laughs> Moving on. Uh, so sure enough, uh, we make our way uh, through a similar process that I showed you before, and then we're able to make all kinds of structures. Um, I think to, to the credit of superstar PhD and Hendrik Rock, he's devised a new family of structures that didn't exist before. Uh, by the magic of 3D printing, you're now able to print these in multiple colors and multiple materials, a new capability indeed, I think. Uh, you develop that still further, you can write functions. Uh, those of you with, uh, uh, with a, a medical bias in your training might start to look at some of these things and think, ooh, that could be useful for a given application. If you find yourself saying, ooh, that could be useful for a given application, please do come and have a chat with me. I'd love to find out and I'd love to learn from you for how some of these things might be used. But I did play with some of these things for a different engineering application, uh, albeit a mechanical engineering application. Uh, complicated graphs in the bottom, don't worry about those for the moment, but wouldn't it be great if you could superimpose stochastics into engineering structures? This is what we call a pin fin array. Pin fins are everywhere uh, from your, your laptop. So those, those of you on laptop, when you ask your laptop to do something really clever, you'll hear the fan go in the background. What the fan's doing is it's trying to get rid of all the latent heat that your processor, doing all the clever things you want it to do, looking at all the cat pictures on social media, it's trying to cool down and dissipate that heat. One of the ways we do that is, is these things, pin fins, super boring, but omnipresent everywhere we see them in engineering. Uh, so wouldn't it be great if you could use some of the principles that I talked about to redesign these? It turns out you perform a, a long, long campaign of experiments. You build a system to be able to evaluate these. You get lots of data. And what you find is that there's this sweet spot there's, there's this region where if you turn the randomness up a little bit, you get slightly improved performance. Okay, we were able to show time and time again that there's what we call the Goldilocks zone. Not too random, not random enough. A region where just turning that dial up a little bit improved performance. Only a small amount, only by one or two percent in enhanced performance. Uh, but we calculated if every pin fin that was used around the world 
suddenly flip, flip to this and we have 2% saving, it would be about the annual uh, emission, it would be the annual emission saving of Germany per year, just by changing these pin fins. Mundane, but hugely valuable. Okay, uh, so if you're still thinking I'm crazy, well, I, well, I'm not the only person. So if you if you check out these two pattern numbers, uh, one's a GB pattern, one's a, a worldwide patents application, you'll see that the Siemens Corporation uh, has paid for a patent application of which I'm the inventor with the team that I showed you before. Uh, and so these figures, which appear in our publications, uh, this pin fin array, which I've just shown you, are figures taken from the patent. So I might be crazy, but I, I'm not the only one as Mr. Lennon said. So where next? Uh, well, I'm hugely lucky. I have this fantastic growing team at UBC, uh, which is now multidisciplinary. Uh, I think what we would like to do is expand that. We'd like to reach out to a wider community. We'd like to get more engagement. We'd like to find people who are end users, collaborators, people who can help steer us. And they'll be across computer science. They'll be across medicine. They'll be across the biological world. They might be across mathematics. If this is interesting, do please come and talk to me. But the problem is big and we want to create lots more families and we want to come up with new optimization tools and new approaches for this, uh, but that is, is down the road. Uh, and I won't talk about optimization and randomness and that. But I will talk about democratization of design for my last kind of five minutes, if I may, five or 10 minutes. So um, going back, to the teaching that I talked about earlier, and I showed you one or two of the artifacts. Actually, I think there's another artifact here. Um, one group of students designed a professional nose picking device. Um, please don't hold my hand. It's not really a nose picking device. Um, so the students involved in this, they, they weren't creating the artifacts. The things that I passed around, please do not consider that as the deliverable in its own right. It's the design methodology that gives rise to that. So this is not a professional nose picking device. It is in fact a multi-tool. Uh, and that again is driven by uh, a piece of software that the students developed uh, from that cohort. So for me, the tool development, enabling non-expert users to do clever things is a key part of, of design of the future. Let's use an example from history. Uh, so this is probably uh, a segue into more useless facts, but help illustrate a point. Uh, so the Vasa, uh, has anybody been to visit? There's some hands going up. Uh, yes. The best museum comfortably I've ever seen in my life. It was just an awesome experience. Uh, talk about history coming alive. Uh, but there's so many lessons to be learned, uh, both in mechanical design, but more, more broadly design, I think. And it's kind of the, the best example of what I would call autocratic design that I could possibly think of. So if you don't know the, the story, uh, King of Sweden, King Gustavus Adolphus, he even sounds important by his name, doesn't he? So he, he says, you know, the, the Swedish Empire is doing pretty well these days. And I want to make a landmark statement. I want everybody outside of the Swedish Empire to know that I mean business. So he embarks on this huge engineering, maritime engineering project of building the galleon uh, to supersede all galleons. And when the boats lay down, so when they start this process of building the boat, it's meant to carry 56 guns. Five months later, the starvus gets out of bed, big yawn, he's just, 56 guns is just not enough. I need 72. So he goes back to his shipbuilder and says, scrub all of those plans, start again. I want 72 guns and I want them on the top deck. And you can see where this is going, right? So the shipbuilder then has a meeting with his mates in the shipyard and says, oh my goodness, King's going to cut off my head unless I do something here. What am I going to do? Am I going to build a ship that sinks or am I going to make the changes that he requests? And rumor has it that that shipbuilder said, oh, I've got a bit of a cough and I'm not feeling very well and disappears. So they get a series of shipbuilders and, and leaders who come in and then say, I'll give the king what he wants, ultimately. So the king gets this, this, this huge galleon. Uh, Europe's a complicated place at that point in time. Some people would say it's still fairly complicated. Uh, as a, a residing in a country or formerly residing in a country that went to Brexit, I can't disagree. But the, the king is quite clear that he wants to make a statement despite all of the resistance and all of the good advice that he's offering. He says, no, this galleon will, will launch and end all galleons. Sure enough, it sails out 1.4 kilometers, uh, gets out to sea and sinks almost immediately. 
the engineering reason was it was top heavy. There was the slightest breeze and the ship just f flopped. Uh, lots of people lost their lives uh, and it was a big disaster. But for me, that is kind of one of the most obvious examples of autocratic design. So this is uh, somebody or a small group of people uh, addressing problems which they've defined uh, and addressed because they have the means to do it. There was nobody there to say, hang on, mate, this is the most ridiculous idea I've ever heard of in my life. So the reverse of that, oh, by the way, if you've, if you've not seen the museum, this is what it looks like. If you find yourself in Stockholm, do go. It's well worthwhile. Uh, so it, that is a stark example, I think, of, uh, of autocratic design. But our disciplines... Uh, and, and mine being, or, or domain was the term that I think we used yesterday when we talked about this, are autocratic to a degree. We have a set of rules and posh words which keep us in and keep other people out. Uh, I'm not sure if you've read French's engineering drawing from 1947. Uh, it's a fantastic read. Uh, I tend to just do a couple of pages or a couple of lines and it puts me straight to sleep. Uh, but if you have to flick through this tome, uh, and it's it's just so beautifully prepared. The love and attention that went into this is absolutely magnificent. But if you're to work your way through this, in the first chapter, it teaches you how to sharpen a pencil. So that's your first barrier in mechanical design in circa 1947. If you can't sharpen a pencil, you can't be a mechanical engineer, I'm afraid. Uh, it teaches you how to use drawing instruments. It teaches you how to, to create 3D geometry. It teaches you how to, to, to render and use machine tools, in this case, the king of machine tools, the lathe, no less. But it also teaches you how to, to model in solids and how you might need a craft knife to do that. The point I'm making is that there are all of these barriers that keep people like me in, who have an understanding of the book, and people like some of you who are not. That's rubbish. What if you want to design and make stuff for yourself? What happens if you don't have time to, to engage with this process, to read this, this big book, what happens if you're not able to do that? Shouldn't we really have tools and capabilities that allow non-experts to solve problems for themselves? Uh, so that's really what I, I, I mean when I'm talking about democratization of design. And for me, that is the creation of tools and the means to allow others to define and address the problems they face, resulting in a vastly increased set of solutions that are relevant to person community specific problems. Uh, and there are good examples of this. So this is, this is already happening. Uh, I'm a big fan of Tony Ears as well of the Victoria Hand Project, uh, which uh, which addresses the need for prosthetics, low cost, customized prosthetics, prosthetics around the world. There's a wonderful job of engaging with uh, end users and patients and franchising them in uh, in the design process for a solution that works for them. And this is a this is a shimmering example. One one point I'd like to to pick up on is I I, I met a colleague from. The hand project a couple of weeks ago uh, and one of the things that they noted was that demand for kind of these these kind of black iron man type hands is prevalent in western europe and north america where there's a feeling like this kind of looks cool but as you make you, you make your way further into asia there's a strong preference preference for more skin toned and uh, as natural looking as possible prosthetics uh, that was a revelation for me uh certainly relating the kind of the cultural aspect of the design because as i said before designing bits of metal is far easier uh so the mechanical engineer is under attack uh we're, we're going to create all of these fancy bits of software that, that, that mean this book is no, no longer necessary and the know-how doesn't need to reside in a person we're now enabling patients to do without clinicians and be able to serve themselves uh but i think all academic disciplines in, in the applied scientists are under this attack as well and are going to be under pressure to allow people and communities to do things themselves. Architects, why have they got their own language and processes that they use for themselves? Why, why can't we enable other people to do that by giving them the tools to do that? The electrical engineer, same deal as the mechanical engineer. Let's make it simple. Let's democratize that. Uh, but also community and town planning. I think there's tremendous opportunity to, to enable these things there also. Conscious that I'm at risk of overstaying my welcome. Uh, it's, I've spoken for about 45 minutes now, I think. Uh, but, you know, a bit of light relief and to relate that back to the teaching. You know, I, I think that that is a key element of the design for additive manufacturing is not delivering the solution, not solving your problem, but creating the solution for many people to solve their problems. Give me a tool that makes my mouse for me, makes it easy, makes means that I don't have to read the big book on mouse design. 
help me do it, solve the difficult things for me and allow me to concentrate on what's important to me. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's, this is to, to, to evidence that I do this myself. My summer project this year is, is designing and building a guitar from scratch. If you look in the top drawer of my office, it, it looks like an Aladdin's cave of broken guitar parts, which I've collected over the summer. Uh, but I'm also using Blender to help me design a guitar that I want. But I'm not going to design the guitar that I want. I'm going to design the process which, A, gives me my guitar, but then is exportable to allow others to do theirs. That's what I mean by democratization of design. Uh, to wrap up, uh, I've worked with a huge number of fantastic people in, in, in my little career uh, and stakeholders who've really helped me take things to where I wanted them to go. And it would have been impossible to do anything without their help. At that point, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention and invite questions and discussion. Stunned into utter silence. Please. How, how do you address concerns that might be raised by industry around um, mo moving towards individualized solutions, where you can't just ma mass manufacture, turn a bit, turn an easy dollar? No. Um, so, how do you talk to industry about democratization? This is a fantastic question. So, uh, I'm not going to name the company that I was involved in, but they make spinny gas turbine things uh and i went to a meeting probably four or five years ago and what they do is they get their, their technical fellows together and they have this kind of annual power and they talk about how they might do things at scale what they might change about culture uh and there was one speaker who said the next billion dollar idea and the, the essence of the talk was we as a company are looking for the next billion dollar idea we've set up an office explicitly in our headquarters to go looking for this billion dollar idea and then somebody put their hand up and said, well, the next billion dollar idea doesn't necessarily come from uh, a blue chip workshop or an office that you set up. Most likely it comes from somebody's garage. It comes from somebody's back bedroom because you've got that population effect. Some of the, you know, the, the people that I admire most in kind of the blender community, that design space are much younger than me. Uh, they're not formally operating out of a university or an institution that we'd recommend, but they're ingenious. They're making tremendous contributions. So uh, the, the, there's one guy who refers to himself as bad normals. That's something like half a million followers. I have just under 10,000 citations to my papers. This person is providing content that is both educational and research-based uh, for seemingly no fee whatsoever impacting the lives of many, many people, which dwarfs the impact that I might make as a professor at a world-leading university. So I think that, there's, that we've got to start accepting that kind of that kind of challenge when we, we look at the, the open source community and that, the, the, the hack space community. These are incredibly ingenious people that need to be enabled. But then, of course, then you've got the, 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 this kind of the, the balance. Issue. Well, how am I going to make money out of this? Am I really comfortable with these people working in this way? And I think that's largely an unanswered question. I think business, big business should start to invest and invest heavily in enabling these things. Oh, wow, you're doing amazing things. You're having impact. Can we sponsor you? Can we fund your channel? Can we move to a better commercial relationship? Could you be our new head of innovation? Um, I think there's opportunities there. How you, uh, how you execute that, I don't know. But that tension is rising and rising and rising. I think the whole issue of individualized solutions in your field and individualized medicine, mm -hmm. which is you know the, the thing, perfect opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure how all that would fit together, but you're you're coming in and talking about essentially the same thing. Yeah. So I, I, I was telling colleagues yesterday. I went uh, to BCIT. Uh, they had a, a prosthetics kind of open house thing uh, a week last Friday. They assembled, I think, 45 clinicians from across BC. So straight away, that's telling you that there's interest in this. 45 clinicians can be released from their day job to come along. That's, you know, that's an investment from BC Health of tens of thousands of dollars, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars, because they're not serving clinics. And you speak to these people and they're A, interested. They want to know what the next cool thing is. They want to know how it can be incorporated into their workflow. So I spoke to one colleague who spent day after day crafting uh, splints and things for patients. Uh, and often in children, they need to be recycled and re refreshed. If you live remotely, you've got to travel 
best part of half a day by road, come in, uh, see a clinician. Clinicians are expensive. Why wouldn't they're fully economically costed? So is there a way where you, you rely less on the clinician and enable the patient to serve themselves more? I, I just think that there's so much fantastic work to be done about that. But that's uncharted territory for me. These people have feelings. I can't believe it. Please, at the back. First point, uh, I'm wondering what is the explanation for this uh, magic uh, of randomness? Yeah. So basically, it, does this mean that actually the initial pattern that we had was not optimal? And this randomness, it just brings this pattern to more optimal state. Is that because of the initial pattern is optimal in like ideals, uh, mm -hmm. ideals uh, environments, and the actual environment where it operates is not ideal, and having some randomness mitigates this like uh, diversion from uh, ideality of the environment. Or what is actually the explanation? And did you have a second question as well, or was that was that? Yeah. It? Did you have a second question as well? Or was... no, 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 no. Okay, so absolutely spot on. So we would call this an objective function. So please use this amount of material to transfer heat in this particular way, or please use this amount of material to, to provide me structural support at the bridge. And that, that technology has existed for a long time uh, where I can almost get that off the shelf. I push play and say, give me the right solution. Put those bits of material that I have available in the right place. But that's not really synonymous with, with how things tend to grow and biological solutions emerge. So uh, one of the things that we see in the structures, in, which is common to all of the structures that I showed you, is that they, they grew, but they weren't subtracted from a bigger volume. And it's the, the growth rule in nature, if you like, is always underpinned by what, what they call, the chemist would call diffusion limits. So I grow and grow and grow until I run out of the nutrients or the reactants that gives rise for that effect that I'm looking for. And then when that runs out, I just grow in another direction. So all of those structures are, are, are born out of that. And I guess what I'm interested in is, is not just the kind of design aspect only where I would be relying on traditional optimization methods, but coupling these things to manufacturing processes of the future where I grow a solution without having to perform any other computation methods. So it doesn't happen that, you know, when um, the queen bee, for example, decides, you know, uh, we're, we're going to build a honeycomb, there's no optimization routine that takes place. The system deploys entropic limits to come up with that solution. It's self-constraining. And I just think that that is just a, a fantastic way for us to think about how we use our resources in the future. So what you're scratching on is, is kind of a future direction I would like to explore but I really don't know where that's going to go. And if you want to have a coffee and talk about it, you'd like to, if you could come over to mechanical engineering, just creep in, they won't get you on us. And come over and say hello. We'd love to talk to you. Uh, I think you, you might have had your hand up first. Uh, sure. Uh, going back to the democratization of the science. Yeah. So once we made this tool that can theoretically be used, by individuals to find solutions for themselves. Mm -hmm. Do you have any advice or thoughts on how you get those tools in the hands of people so that they're actually using them and enjoying them? Oh, what I'll do is I'll send them angry emails and say, please use this technology and they'll 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 definitely use it. Um I've got to be frank about it, that's something that I don't have a huge amount of experience of. I'm smart enough to understand that we're all different. I'm smart enough to understand that we all have different expectations and appealing to people. Uh, requires a multitude of different approaches. Um, so that's something in due course I'm just going to have to get help with. I'm going to have to rely on other people to, to help me do that if this does progress. How about, how about your thoughts? Have you got to... Yeah, I'm going to ask you a question. You asked me one. <laughs> Fair's fair. Yeah. So how, how, would, how would you deal with... So let's, let's use one of the... Explore one of the examples that I didn't discuss uh, you and I set up this open source tool, which allows hobbyists who'd like to build small structures in their back garden. Uh, we built it, it works fantastic, right? 
how do we control that launch? How do we how do we make it available? It's easy. You, you put it on GitHub. You give it give it to people for free. But how do you build a community around that? How do you how do you overcome that 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 static inertia and get it moving? Yeah, I think um, one powerful tool that now exists is like Gitro Media. So if you can you know uh, come up with a compelling like use case of this. Uh, tool and then build it out and then show people that not only like is it a you know cool solution but also it's easy to access this solution and others like it with this technology when you put it on youtube or something and then you you know uh come up with a catchy uh title and thumbnail and then a lot of people watch the video mm -hmm. i think that's one potential way and I and, and, and could it be me as kind of a, a balding middle-aged white guy standing in front of the structure that I built in my garden with my hands on my hips and saying, look at what I did, it's fantastic. Is that is that what we would want from that? <laughs> okay. Thanks. I appreciate the discussion. Thank you. Did you have a question also? Sure. I was, I was waiting for someone else to answer, ask the question. Uh, so, so Flinders are really cool tool, but it has a difficult user interface. It's extremely powerful and very, very complex. So there's, uh, in some, some of what you've done is kind of move the barrier to a different barrier. Yeah. So where, where does that converge? And like you talked about um, how the Brittany and Young's uh, tech literate audience you have to the Flinders interface, yeah. which is a pretty big barrier still, mm -hmm. given the where you're trying to do this. Um, yeah. So, do you see a pathway? Yeah. Uh, so, for the for the, the non Blender users, um, Blender was developed by the person who, who originally developed the graphics for Neo Geo. If you're as old as I am and you remember Generation One of computer games, Neo Geo was like the thing that was better than Sega and better than, than Nintendo. Um, and it's a, a Dutch guy who then actually sold the technology, but then we bought the technology to then give it away open source. I mean, it's, for me, it's an icon of, of building an open source community. Uh, that's literally grown arm and arms and legs over the last 25, 30 years. It's still absolutely free and touts itself as always being free. What does it do? Uh, well, it's a tool that you can use to make video games. It's a tool that you can use to make solid models. So 3D printing enthusiasts like myself love it. It's a tool to make renders. Uh, if you look at top end journals now in the nature and science family, often the graphics that are generated through these use the, the, the blended tool. Perhaps the most fantastic thing about it is the community around it. Hey, has anybody done such and such in Blender? Can I get a bit of help? And most of the time, if your question is not too boring, somebody's going to get involved and help out. You know, I follow the, the Blender Reddit and it's just the most fantastic eye candy as you, you scroll through this before you drop off to sleep. But the point is very well taken. The barrier to entry is still super high. Uh, if you want to program within Blender, you still need to be able to do a bit of program. If you want to be able to create something that looks and feels good, you have to have some understanding of industrial or graphic design. We can make add-ons and tools that live inside Blender that make that easier. But you're right, the barrier has only been reduced so far. I think that we need to think about accessibility to the software. I think we need to take that that barrier to entry lower still. And that's something that, uh, again, is probably outside of my expertise. Creating the functionality and then thinking about the user interface so that that human that human machine interaction or that human software interaction, I think does definitely need to, to be considered further. I think the problem is even more difficult than that. It's like you could, you could make, uh, let's say, you could imagine a friendlier interface to Blender, but to do that, you have to give up power. You have to focus something so you can say, all right, we'll uh, make an interface blender that lets you do a particular thing really mm -hmm. easily. And then that's successful, but it doesn't have specific power. But then you basically just simplify the interface and things, and you've mm -hmm. lost the freedom, yeah. which was the whole point. Mm -hmm. So, how, so it's a trying to, it's always going to be true when you abstract out the expertise in the Yeah, as far as I know, I, I think you're exactly right. So, in the in, in, in my domain in manufacturing technology, they used to refer to something called expert systems, 
So I, I don't want my operator to have to make these complicated decisions. I want my operator to do the bit that I need them for and everything else would be made, but the decision would be made by an, an expert system. And of course, when you, when you relinquish full control, you get a, the benefit is you get a simpler system, but you get something that just doesn't have the functionality and the freedom that you might want. And thus there will always be that kind of, that balance between the two. How you solve that, I don't know, but I guess that there's a huge community of people investigating this sort of thing. Well, there should be. So maybe a system that can create yeah. that. One more question. Oh, or do you want to close well, things? I, I think I'm getting a signal from uh, the, 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 the official time. The official time. So, we so we, uh, Adam, thank you very much for joining us and yeah. presenting yeah. today. Thanks so much. Adam, Adam is staying around for the next hour. So do please feel free to come and chat with him. And uh, there's, I think there's still some food over there for anybody who didn't get it earlier. There might be new food. New food. <laughs> thanks very much. And thanks to those of you online. If you have any questions and put them in the chat, then uh, maybe Adam can answer that. <laughs> awesome. OK, thanks. Hello. Right. Or no, uh, good. Um, yeah. 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 Yeah.